second slide, please. Okay, um, so it's a packed agenda again, and we really want to be finished by nine o'clock. Um, so let's try not to waffle too much, let's be concise. Um, I've, uh, I've asked Steve Jones to facilitate the questioning session, so both round the table and when the public speaks in order that we can get concise contributions and then move quickly on. Um, and you are encouraged, yeah. <laughs> um, and I would really just like yet again to say that uh, respect for officers please, even if we don't like what they're proposing, um, this, you know, I, I, I'd like everyone at least to be um, polite and, and, and well done, please. So, the minutes of the last meeting, um, in, that was in Comberton, it was here on the 17th of March. Um, I was looking through them earlier today, and there are really two outstanding issues that were, haven't really been dealt with um, in the meantime. One of them um, is the representation of residents' associations on the, on the LA from the city, and the other one is uh, inbound flow control. Um, the, representation, the, the representation of the um, residents' associations on the LLF, we may have to leave again until the next meeting, but I have done some um, brief analysis of this just to um, help us understand what the issues are. Um, this came after the application of two more streets in North Newham, Lansdowne Road and Clark Maxwell Road, to be members of the LLF. Um, so I have decided to investigate whether there is a case for a bit in more residence associations to make the representation on the LLF more balanced. And also to counter the, uh, the claim level that the LLF does not really represent um, the city as well as outlying places. So I've plotted where the membership comes from. Um, I can't see, I know you can't see that very well, but there are, um, I will, I will, um, I will send that to everybody later. There are 10 um, parish councils who regularly, this is people who regularly turn up. So there are 10 parish councils, there are six um, residence associations, there's two city councillors, six district councillors, four county councillors, and three special interest groups. And if you give me the next slide, please. Um, so there are 10 regular um, attendees from uh, the city of the 31 regular attendees, which is 32%. Um, I then did a brief population analysis, and the population of the is about 8,500. And the population of the villages affected by the scheme um, is about 25,100. So that's 33% of the representation um, uh, is new uh, is the city. Um, so, Actually, I've concluded that that's really quite representative, and I'm quite happy that people look at that and come back to me in the next meeting. I think for now, the data suggests that it is quite well balanced, and there isn't really a convincing case for allowing additional residents' associations at this time. Um, I know I've learned that on you today, and I'm quite happy that you go away and counter it, but um, for now, on the population and the attendee basis, it does seem to be actually surprisingly balanced. Um, the second issue that has been dealt with is inbound flow control, and this is something that Smart Cambridge Transport does that we ask uh, City Deal uh, to investigate, um, and that doesn't seem to have taken place. Could you just confirm? I don't think that's happening, is it? Um, would you like to comment on that very briefly? Uh, yes, it was the. Is this on? 
Is it on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. At the, um, I can't remember which meeting it was now, but it was, it was last held here. Um, I presented very briefly the idea of using inbound code control as an alternative to a bus lane um, running the entire length of um, the 3 into Cambridge. Um, I, I, I guess we actually have to propose this to the board rather than to the offices because it, you know, the initiative has to come uh, from the board. Um, but I, I do believe that this should be considered alongside other options, including option six. Option one and option three A um, as, as a way of prioritizing buses um, on that con most congested part of the route. Mm. Okay, well, can I suggest that then, because I've been making a presentation to the Joint Assembly on Wednesday, that we have to put that forward and um, that work is, and we ask them to do that work. Okay, and will you be presenting to the, um, the board as well on the 26th? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, just before we get on to the vice chair, I just thought I'd give a very brief summary of what's happened since uh, March the 17th, um, uh, because it has been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so, uh, in the last meeting, um, uh, we, uh, the LLF asked us to uh, uh, take forward option six and present it to the board, which ten of us did on um, April the 11th. We tried to make that group of ten as representative geogra geographically as possible of the LLF. Um, there was, uh, we, so we presented it, there was a bit of disagreement on what was agreed <laughs> after the meeting, but the executive board did agree to assess option six alongside option 33A and option one, so that's, that's good news. And agreed to make recommendations to the board, that is themselves, um, in July, so in this meeting, to incorporate option six into the appraisal process. Um, they also agreed that we could see the commission brief um, for the assessment, and our comments would be considered for finalising the brief. Um, Atkins were appointed to do the work. Um, and then we also agreed a smaller subset group, we call the technical workshop group, um, who have been working with Atkins since that time. Um, again, I'm trying to make it as geographically representative as possible with uh, Steve Jones um, representing the 23 parishes out west, Gabriel Fox from QTSQ, and Ward Council from the city. And they've been looking at and assessing the validity of an evidence to justify the busway um, and the new park and ride site, re reviewing the criteria and agreeing the criteria of um, assessment and comparison. Um, we agreed, I think it was 13 criteria, um, and uh, we were very pleased to be part of the collaboration process. But unfortunately, um, the final scoring, um, but we, we, um, we don't agree with it. We don't think it's not that it's objective, and the general item 7 will deal with the, um, our issues with that. Um, we also attended a park and ride workshop. Um, uh, again, there was a long week of to and fro about who was on the invitee list, but when we got there, there was overwhelming support for um, a site uh, one junction back before uh, the congestion, um, uh, even from the bus operators actually, um, and that, that being the best location on grounds, grounds of access uh, being cited before congestion begins, connectivity with the road network, and environmental impact. Um, in the board packs, you can see some recognition of the outcomes of this workshop in the park and ride recommendations, but we do have um, some issues with the way the sites have been ordered and scored, um, which uh, is dealt with with, um, I think it's resolution four. Um, workshops more generally, following instruction from the uh, Western Orbital LLF last month, I wrote a letter to Greater Cambridge Partnership, um, the CEO and the Head of Transport, asking um, uh, uh, detailing a list of concerns we have about the way uh, workshops have been um, conducted to date. I've yet to receive a reply and um, I think we should uh, push them for a reply on this. Um, but we do, uh, but we have asked for input into, um, well we want advance notice of the workshops and we want to know what the invitee lists are, um, that they're published in advance. Uh, we want to know what the terms of references are, we want to know the aims of the meeting, the desired outcomes, 
We want to know how feedback will be gathered and how it will feed into the process going forward, and what weight will be given to the feedback from various stakeholders. So we've asked for input in that, and we're waiting for a response. And again, I think it's going to be one thing that needs to be pushed when I speak to Judge Sunday and Wednesday. Um, finally, back to um, a bit of good news. Uh, the Mayor is here to talk to us about longer term transport strategy um, and let's, uh, let's hope this schemes uh, prove good value for money, more long term, less environmentally damaging than those we see in front of us um, in these board packs. But just before we go on to that, um, we need to vote for the Vice Chair. Um, there have been um, two candidates put their names forward. Um, one uh, is Bridget and one is Tim. Um, and so I think we're going to have to um, uh, see if we can apply the power. Would either of you like to say anything before we go? allowed to do before it's up for uh, uh, being voted on again. I would really like to continue uh, for another three meetings. I think the, the added extra that I can offer is the fact that I'm an assembly member and I'm also um, a South Cambridgeshire District Councillor, so I mean, as is Tim I know, but I think the fact that I'm on an assembly means that I'm possibly more immersed in the uh, delights of the uh, Key Calling at City Deal, the Greater Cambridge Partnership, than, uh, than many other people. So I hope you will uh, support me continuing to do it. It's been a pleasure to do it on your behalf. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, yeah, um, well, hello everybody. And uh, I'd first like to say it's uh, me putting my name as uh, potential vice chair isn't a reflection on Bridget, it's just sometimes we need to change. Um, like Bridget, I'm a South Cairns District Councillor that actually live in here in Cumberton, so I'm close enough to the guys from the city and also close enough to sort of Bourne and Campbell and Catchment area. Just recently, I've been uh, given the post of environmental champion for South Cairns, and the one thing that uh, Helen certainly alluded to, I am very, very worried about our environment with our friends from the City Deal or the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership. <coughs> and so for that reason, uh, I'll put my name forward. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes, I think these two should leave before the presentation. This is a really difficult decision because what we have in front of us are two excellent candidates. I've known them both for quite a long time. Bridget has worked tirelessly for the LLF and on the City Deal. She writes an excellent blog. She has been very active and uh, informative uh, about all the City Deal's uh, dealings. Uh, I have seen her uh, working on the assembly, she talks an awful lot of sense and it would be a shame if in voting for Tim we actually lose uh, the capabilities that this amazing woman has got. Tim is a different sort of person altogether, a different personality, he's a countryman, he's a farmer, he served for some time on uh, Barton Parish Council which is how I know him and uh, he he loves this area, as, as I'm sure Bridget does as well. Um, so, I wouldn't want to disappoint either of them, but my personal feeling is for the next three meetings, it might be a good idea if we have a change. Not that there's anything wrong with what you've done, Bridget, you've been phenomenal. But that's my personal view. Uh, 
faced with an incredibly difficult decision because who would want to disappoint either of these two wonderful people? Thank you. District Council for Caldicott. Um, I think the first speaker was well out of order. Um, there was no reason to say what he did. Um, secondly, I think one person doing the job uh, is more than adequate. And um, thirdly, the party political representation is completely irrelevant. This is non-partisan, non-political. We're working towards the solution. So that is definitely not an issue. Thank you. Thank you. 
10, 11, 12, 13. Have you got the green paper? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, oh, thanks, Gabriel. Sorry, actually. But COVID, perhaps. Okay. <coughs> okay, Bridget has it. Okay.
So we have to utilise the surrounding area. We have to connect St Neots and Hayley Hill <coughs> and potentially uh, Mr Trump willing uh, Millwood Hall Air Base, but you know, I don't want to get into the politics of America as well, uh, but it is, it is a huge part of what we're trying to achieve here. And we have to connect them with a system that is safe, that people know how to use, and is efficient, and is affordable. Because this is about housing growth as well. The way you pay for systems like the underground light rail, the way you pay for potentially for an M11 extension, or an A10, uh, or an A47, um, and the other schemes before you mention them, <laughs> we need in Cambridge here. You have to come up with an idea, or a way of paying for these schemes, because simply ticket sales are not going to be enough in the short term, certainly, to pay them. So, I've been mentioning this several times over the last couple of months, and I've been speaking to the government about this as well. I believe in a land cap uh, for the areas where we are putting forward our major schemes for Cambridge. And let me try and explain how a land cap potentially would work. And I'll use, as we're uh, to the west of Cambridge, I'll use uh, a potential light rail link between Cambridge and St Neots as an example of how it could be paid for. If you introduce a land cap along the corridor of growth, currently land value without a white railway, where there's no growth, is agricultural price, which is around eight to ten thousand pounds an acre. As soon as you put a light railway in and somebody draws a magic line around the settlement, that price goes up from eight to ten thousand pounds an acre to around a million to a million and a half thousand an acre. And that money is lost to the greater economy. It's absolutely wonderful for those people who own the land where the magic line has been put around, uh, but that money is lost to the economy. I believe that uh, if you were to cap land value at 10 times agricultural price, I think that's a fair return on land that goes for housing. But you take the land value comes back into the system. So if you were to build, for example, on the edge of, Hay on the edge of St. Neots, 10,000 new houses where the land had been capped at £100,000 an acre, of those houses which are market houses, which would be around 7,000, you could have an average, these are, don't, don't, um, don't quote me on these prices, I'm just giving you an example, you could have an average of £30,000 a house uh, that could be paid back into the fund that was used to set up the, uh, the line in the first place. And you repeat that along the line where the growth happens between St Neots and Haverhill, and you can see how vast amounts of money can be paid back into uh, a fund that is needed to, uh, uh, to set up and drive forward an underground and night rail for Cambridge. You can't really do that in the centre, the most expensive bit, because the land is already mostly developed. But you can do it on the periphery. You add to that, of course, the ticket sales over a 20 to 30 year period <coughs> or more, and you can understand suddenly how an investor might be interested in coming to the command authority and talking to us about uh, how you can build a light railway or something similar. I don't want to cut out the ABRT issue because it's not been studied again, where one has not been studied against the other. But uh, I'm just using that as an example. So the fact is that if it's affordable, it becomes achievable. I believe it's affordable and I believe it's achievable. And then you have to bring in time frames. And I have to rely on people who know about these things because I've, I don't know how many you have, but I've never built an underground or a railway, so I have to rely on people who have. And those people who have are telling me the problem isn't cleaning the tunnels or laying the track, the problem is getting it through the process. And I also think that because of this new combined authority that we now have, we have an ability to get it through the process much more quickly. I'm also not naive enough to expect that uh, when the plans go forward to where the railway goes, that some of you very people who are upset by the busway might also be upset by the light rail. So nothing is ever simple, and there is no answer that pleases everybody. But I will go back to my original statement that is 
The situation we are in doesn't please everybody either, and a solution must be found. So, I'm not, as I said, I'm not here to criticise the GCP. They're working uh, under a smaller geographical area than I am, and their remit is slightly different to my remit. But we have a housing crisis that needs to be solved. We have an economy that is growing at an extraordinary amount in this part of the country, and we have a traffic problem. So I put it to you that a light rail, an underground for Cambridge, is affordable and achievable, and I put it to you that I will work to both make sure that these, uh, these, these words are not hollow, but are, are, are ones that I can back up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Any questions on either of the bit? Thank you. I've been interested in uh, Colin Harris's light rail plans for a long time, and I've been a long-term supporter of his ideas. And I've been doing some research into the, uh, the ability of people to switch from car transport to other means of transport. Um, this is just one of a, a number of reports that I've read. Consistent market research and experience over the last 50 years in Europe and North America shows that car commuters are willing to transfer some trips to rail-based public transport, but not to buses. Typically, light rail systems attract between 30 and 40% of their patronage from former car trips. Rapid transit bus systems attract less than 5% from cars less than the variability of traffic. So in addition to it being affordable, it is the light rail system likely to have a higher ridership. Well, um, it has to be user accessible. So uh, the mod most modern uh, light railway systems are driverless and uh, therefore can run late and early, uh, neither of which are current bus system does, or they will be looking to review the system, of course, uh, as well. But um, so you've got the figures. I think that is right. Uh, I haven't done personal research on that, but we will be putting, putting work into that. The figures that I've been given is it will take around 30% of the cars off the road where there is a light rail. So that corresponds really with what you're saying. I'm sure that all of us will agree that if you can get 30% of the cars off the road, that's good for. It's good for the commuters, it's good for the environment, it's good for the health of the people who use the roads and live in the towns and villages around Cambridge and in the city itself. So, if, if that could be achieved, I would be very, very happy with it. We have a couple of questions over here. Can you introduce yourself, Alistair? Sure. Uh, James, Alan Tracy from Cosway. Good evening. Thanks for coming along. It's been very interesting to hear your thoughts. And I was particularly struck by your comment that one's got to look outside the immediate remit of the City Deal people when considering what is the right transport solution for the area. Uh, given your remarks, wouldn't it make sense for you to have a seat on the City Deal? <laughs> I would rather be independent, and uh, I believe that as two of my cabinet members already uh, on the city deal, uh, I don't feel that I need to be there as well. Uh, both uh, Lewis Herbert, the leader of the city council, and uh, and Peter Topping are trusted uh, members of my cabinet, and uh, I don't think that me being on there would help the situation at all. I think that uh, that they are able and quite capable without me being there to, to make these decisions. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So we've got one here and three here, so we'll start here. Thank you. Um, Mr Mayor, um, Anthony Carpen, um, I'm filming this evening. I've been one of the people also who's backed and been very interested in the light rail um, concept that Colin Harris came up with. I run the Facebook page. How do you see um, the role of people in the community um, who support the light rail working with um, to support the whole process all the way through? to its finish, because we often hear a lot about how people are opposed to transport systems, but 
but this is one certainly where I've heard a lot of people are actually in favour of it. So what do you as our new county mayor see our or less? Thank you. Thank you. Where's uh, uh, I'm filming, so no dragon. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, when are feasibility studies completed? Um, they will go public, and I will ask. We will then obviously go through periods of public consultation, etc., etc. Should it prove to be uh, what I hope it to be, uh, and then I would, I would hope the public will, as well as putting in those who put in negative comments, I would hope the public will take part in the consultation and support. And as we all, as we know in Actually, every situation, whichever, whatever it is, those people who are against are far, far more vocal than those who are for. Um, and as I said, I, I, what, what I'm proposing is not going to please all of you either. You know, that's obvious. It, it, it can't. You know, you can't be a politician and please everybody. Um, you all know that. So, but take part in consultations. You know, put your name forward. If you are in support, make it public that you are. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Penny Heath from the uh, North Union Resident Association. Um, I was wondering in your business plan, uh, concept business plan, whether you included tourism, because Cambridge gets 4.5 million people a year, which is 450 million pounds, and obviously they're trying to encourage people to go and um, spread the prosperity um, into Cambridgeshire. Is that part of your business plan for It's a very good point. Um, well, I Everything we do is legal. So tourism is very much part of what the mine authority is trying to achieve. We, as you say, we, we know that uh, Cambridge has four and a half, five million visitors a year, and those people come to Cambridge for half a day and then go somewhere else. Um, we want them to stay in Cambridgeshire. If they can get around Cambridgeshire much more easily, the chances are that they will they will, uh, they will utilise the system uh, to, to to do that. The problem we have is that many of the people who come to the UK are from very very large countries where coming to visit Cambridge and Stonehenge in one day is not seen as a, a big issue. It's, uh, it's just a pop around the corner. So, of course, they haven't driven around our roads. <laughs> probably get here, so, uh, probably, uh, so, so, so the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, if I was in Peterborough, they would be saying, how do we get these, some of these five million up to Peterborough? If I'm in Ely, they'd say the same. And we, want, we all want to take a share of that five million, uh, uh, tour, the five million tourists that come to the city of Cambridge. But we also want to stay on it. So I think it will help. But I, I can't give you a hand of a piece of sauce. Hello, I'm Jeff Emily from South Cambridge Council. Uh, now, I'd like to ask you um, is it well known this is a deal, Chris Cambridge Partnership, is continuing, the Jumping Horse is, is proceeding, it's spent £1.8 million pounds so far on developing the plans that we are considering in this uh, left. Um, now, your uh, feasibility study is sort of running in parallel with this. this is the, the Great Scale of France is still burning through money um, with consultants to uh, you know, assess the feasibility of all these various op options for busway. At what point do we put a break on this project or call a halt on the feasibility for the light rail and, and choose a path? I mean, it seems madness to be spending money on both unnecessarily. Well, of course, I'm, I'm at fault for that to an extent because I've come into the game late. Uh, the city deal, as it were, were putting forward a solution that was within their, their boundaries, as I've suggested. Uh, but we're trying to work quickly. So we're trying to get the study done at pace to allow GCP <coughs> to see what other options on the table. Um, I think that, uh, that working together as one, we've come up with a solution that's right for not just people of Cambridge and, and, and South Cambridge but beyond uh, and I'm sure that we uh, will find the right solution which will be in the end the best financially feasible system that uh, provides the answer we have. And Des O'Brien. Yeah, Des O'Brien, South Cambridge Judicial Councillor for Bourne. I'm just picking up on Edward's point and you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you, uh, you see yourself as being having a different reading uh, but yet you still cover uh, many of the same areas. So although your area is broader, it, is, it does contain Cambridge and South Cambridge. And I worry, first of all, I am very much in favour of the light rail. Personally, I'm very much in favour of the light rail. But going back to Edward's point, I, I think we're now coming to a bit of a situation where we've got a little bit of a he said, he said she said situation, where I think as, as people locally, we, we read the papers and we, and we hear what other people are saying, and it's very, very difficult to work out how we're going to make progress in this sort of treacle-like situation we've now got, where 
different, more uh, uh, open-ended, and, the, and the, the city deal have proposed something that is very much driven around the, the local plan and getting the local plan through. So we've got lots of sort of conflicts, and I don't really see too many ways of resolving, resolving these easily. There, thank you. There's always a solution, uh, and uh, the solution is necessarily met by uh, uh, me shouting the odds in one room, and sitting there, the GCP shouting the odds in another. So uh, I will ask you to try and trust that we'll work out between us and, uh, and bring you the answer as well. Thank you. Um, well, Edward really asked the question I was going to ask. The only other um, thing I was going to say was, is there a risk that the city deal, Great Change Partnership, um, you know, ploughing on with the busway actually serves to undermine what you would like to do with light rail? Well, the risk is that um, if, if, if that were to happen, um, that this part of the country doesn't get the best possible solution, in my opinion, to, to the transport problems. But, you know, I, I think that we can work together, and I think that we will work together for, for the good of the people of Cambridge and, uh, and Peter. I must say that in, by the way, even though this is not way from here. Um, uh, and it's not just my working with the city that has to be harmonious, it's, it's many other areas as well. So, um, you know, you're going to have to, I'm not tired, and I know you've been doing this. Uh, uh, GCP city deal issue, and the reason why there's so many here is because there's been problems. Uh, but you know, please try and trust us to work it out. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I suppose my question is really from one farmer to the next farmer. Um, 50% of <clears throat> all of the wheat we grow in the United Kingdom is actually grown in you know, 50 mile radius of Cambridge. And so <laughs> it's, it's following on a little bit in front of debt and, uh, about sort of duplication of, of transport links, but, if, but also linked to it is housing. And I don't think with food security and everything like that, uh, I've, I suppose I've been banging on the South Cams and the city here the importance of land. Every hectare you lose is about 19,000 loads of bread out of the supermarkets. And I just wonder what your views were on, uh, on food. Well, uh, perhaps if I could have uh, made that kind of many loads of bread on my grade three land in so on. I perhaps wouldn't be here, uh, annoying someone will be here. <laughs> so, uh, of course, some of the land we have in, in Cambridge here is some of the best agricultural land in the world. Uh, uh, we grow fairly in the land, we grow 70% of the vegetables that we eat in the UK. As you said, some of this, the land here in South Cambridgeshire, extraordinarily strong, good wheat land that I wish I'd have had a few acres of, but didn't have. So, uh, you're right in that some of our agricultural land is outstanding, but we also have some pretty poor state of grade three and grade four land as well. I would love to stand here and say to you we can build 100,000 extra new homes in Cambridge and Peterborough and not go, uh, build on a single acre of, of land, uh, of farm land, but the reality is that we can't. And I think you know that as well as I do. So it's making sure that by creating transport links uh, that we grow, that we grow our houses on the land that perhaps isn't the best to grow on all these numbers. Stephen Jones, last question. Oh, Phil, one more. Okay. Thank you. I suppose my, my question is, is this, uh, I think the bus road lines don't work. And I, I think the bus road lines you can see this evening are an unworkable solution. I mean, for example, somewhere alone there were 100 large tourist buses parked around Range Road. We need an on the ground. But the problem is, and this is my question, is that Cambridge has been, I think, we shortchanged by government. You've been given, Lewis Holder of course talks about, you know, we've got 100 million pounds. And yet there is this disconnect between Cambridge as a city which has hundreds of billions of pounds of company value. And this small amount of money, and the reason we are where we are is because Lewis Holder's banging on about this 100 million point, I've got to build this bus. So my question to you is, how are we going to get people like 
Theresa May to give you £2 million and do the job properly in time to be able to say to people like Lewis, you can't do your cold comfort farm option because that's what you're sort of going for. Uh, well, the answer is I'm not going to get Theresa May to give you £2 billion because uh, uh, I've seen the figures and uh, it, it just isn't happening. So I've got to find ways of putting uh, <coughs> the business plan, Stephen, that, uh, that can create the wealth necessary to build um, to build the light like rail, and that's why I went and spoke in detail about a potential land cap for our, our project. So if I go to government and say we want to build an underground or light railway uh, and it's going to cost us two, two and a half billion, they will say, well, come back when you've done better. Uh, if you look at the Northern Line extension uh, in, in London, uh, it was put together with uh, 25,000 homes plus business growth, etc. And then they were able to go to the market and get investment in. I'm in mean, a fortunate position that we have something here in Cambridgeshire that international investment companies want to invest in, and that's the phenomenon of Cambridge. And they want to be part of that. So we've got to find a way of making sure that those international investors have something tangible to invest in. Uh, and what I'm hearing when I've spoken to them, if they can have something in a project over 30 to 40 years where they gain 3% per annum, that's the kind of interest that they're expecting and wanting from the scheme. So if we can put together a scheme that has a land cap, that has an uplift in the value of the land, which brings back an immediate sum, or some over a period of time, plus city value, I think the sums add up to the investment. And what I want to do is to be able to go to government with not just a scheme for the light rail and the underground for Cambridge, but also, as I've said, the M11, the A10, the A47, Wisbeach Rail, and Uncle Tom Cobby and all, but all the other schemes that are so important to this county, and in the same way, say to government that we've got a clear business plan here that adds up, a relatively small investment, i.e. your backing, will allow us to glean the investment necessary uh, to, to build these, these, these schemes. So, you know, I've always said, I am ambitious and uh, I may fall flat on my face and there's some behind me who will desperately hope I do, <laughs> but, if, but if, I don't, um, if I don't fall flat on my face, we will make better county and one that's fair to everybody, the people will get around and share in the wealth that's here in the South.
that therefore the amount of public money that they're investing uh, doesn't always represent a good uh, investment if, it, if its benefits are short term. So bearing in mind that we've got this contrast now, we've got the mayor, uh, I feel that uh, we, we sh sorry, uh, uh, that we should uh, prefer them to start thinking more long term. Thank you. That was only minute 15, that's very good.
Thank you, Jim. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm quite happy to defer this and actually put the mayor down as a proposal. I'd be more than happy for you to do that, Mayor. Um, my view is quite simply that we should. I have referred in the document to a mass rapid, a rapid mass transport system. I believe that whatever alignment we choose now ought to be the one that is sustained for the longer term. I believe that it should support and help our communities and not inflict damage upon them. And for, that reason, for that reason, I'm asking that the uh, work on option 3A should be suspended at this time until we have uh, a long-term position in place that we can look forward to uh, for many years to come and not just in the short term. Thank you.
voted against um, this, um, this resolution, that it was too descriptive and too descriptive actually to be able to support at this stage. Um, it, it's trying to do too much uh, in, one, in one resolution. And for that reason, I shall not be able to support it. And I think there's others run, but take the field the same. I would be much happier if we took out the last sentence. I'd be able to consider on that basis, but I don't know whether the proposer is, I think, not willing to consider that. It's not definitive. It says ideally north of the A40. It doesn't say it has to be, but it says ideally. It's too much for steer. <coughs> Um, I <clears throat> slightly wanted to stand up uh, a voice of rabbits or anything, <laughs> uh, slightly tongue in cheek. But environmentally, it would make a lot more sense if it did sit very close to the existing um, infrastructure. So, where I've heard various people saying just going in parallel to the current 48, environmentally, I think that would be very sound. Thank you. And we've got one comment from the floor, and then I'll come back. Two comments from the floor. I would just say I don't see the point of a route that misses one of the main villages. If it misses the village, it's not really doing its job, is it? Okay, thank you very much. And one down here. Sorry, you are? Sorry. I'm, I'm from Hardwick. From Hardwick, okay. And this gentleman? Uh, it's a very common solution uh, in a number of countries, but particularly in North America. It's very inexpensive to add light rail along a freeway or motorway route because it takes very little land from the adjacent fields. It passes all uh, the junctions where you can have hubs, if you uh, wish, uh, in order to be able to collect transport. And it does seem to me that uh, at this stage, what we're really being asked to do is to ask that option three stops going any further forward in its present form with the Greater Cambridge Partnership just wasting public money, money that might well be spent on better schemes. And primarily that's what this resolution to me appears to be about. Yeah. And, uh, Bridget. Thank you. Um, some time ago, the Assembly and the Board has had a presentation about the, the bullet bus, for want of a better word, and we were told that these could theoretically run on existing infrastructure. Uh, there was, that was right at the end of the presentation, so I haven't got any more information about it, but, but Professor Miles, I think it was, said that it could run on existing infrastructure. Um, just picking up on Edward's point, if we do not allow uh, whatever, whatever we end up with, if we do not allow the villages and the communities that are going to be most negatively impacted on this to actually repay the benefits, i.e. be able to get on the trains or get on the buses, then all they're getting is the negative side without any of the positives. And I don't know what the answer to this is, but I think we have to bear in mind that if we just have an expressway shooting through the middle of Coton or Harbour or whatever, without them actually being able to uh, use whatever is provided there, then actually we're doing them a big disservice. Um, I don't have a magic answer, really. I, I think we need more information on, 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 on the amount of infrastructure that would be required for something that's potentially travelling at such speeds within five metres of domestic dwellings. It would seem to me that it would have to have a huge amount of, um, of infrastructure to keep our communities safe and so maybe that's one thing we should be asking. What does it actually entail? Because it could be actually that this alignment 3A is completely inappropriate if it means huge concrete walls all the way down. It, it does come very, very close to, to, uh, to dwellings.
I think it's simple to that's too specific. I think it's take out the last sentence and then you're going to go. Yeah. So we're voting on taking the last sentence out. Oh, the last five words, ideally north of the A four to eight. So we're voting on taking those words out. Thank you. 